upon all of his prophets, and in particular upon the last of all of his prophets, the Prophet Muhammad, after whose name I say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In modern times, it has become unfashionable to believe in God. Many people have come to think that there is no God. Some others think that there might be a God, but this God is so remote that he has no concern for the world. And we may as well go, go ahead living our lives as if there is no God. Because he may not exist, and even if he does exist, he doesn't really matter. Some others take the position that we cannot know whether or not God exists. And so, many such people live out their lives as though they are atheists. So if they do not have to worship, they do not have to be concerned about God or God's plan for humankind. They think we cannot know if God exists. And if that is the case, why should we bother with anything like religion? I'd like to show you today, folks, that in fact, there is good evidence that God does exist. There's always been good evidence that God exists. And in modern times, some of the old pieces of evidence have gathered new strength. I'd like to share that opinion with you. One of the ancient arguments advanced for the existence of God is what is referred to as the cosmological argument. That is the argument that uh, we must have had some being to bring everything into existence. People looked around and they said, well, from nothing, nothing comes. Why do we have something instead of nothing? There must have been some creator who brought everything into existence. Why do you have to have a creator? There has to be a first cause, it was said. And that seems logical, it seems rational. If, if we say that A is the cause of B, and B is the cause of C, and C is the cause of D, and then all the way to Z, and then we can go to double A and triple A and all of that, then there will be uh, no ending to that series. Now if we take the series backwards and we find out uh, what was the cause of A, and someone says B, we ask what was the cause of B, someone says C, and what was the cause of C, D, what was the cause of D, E. Now there has to be a first cause somewhere. We cannot go into infinite regression, otherwise A would never have resulted. The fact that we do have this world means that there has to be a first cause. We cannot go back into infinite regression. We say, okay, this world must have been caused by something that came before it. And that must have been caused by something that came before it. And that must have been caused by something that came before it. And then before it. And then before it. There has to be a stop somewhere. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the world that we have today. And so, we have there the cosmological argument for the existence of God. But uh, there came a time after modern Enlightenment Europe when people said that uh, the universe has always been here. They subscribed to what is referred to as the steady state theory. So when we asked, uh, where did all this come from? They said, uh, all this? <laughs> what do you mean where it came from? It's always been here. For a long time, scientists held this view until the 1920s. Edwin Hubble, in the 1920s, looked into his uh, 100 inch telescope and he realized uh, that the clusters of galaxies are all moving away from each other at rapid speed. And to him, that could only mean one thing. It, could, it means that our universe is expanding. Space itself is getting bigger. To illustrate this point, uh, imagine that you take a child's balloon and you put a number of uh, points with a ballpoint pen on that uh, balloon. Now, you blow into that balloon. As the space in that balloon gets bigger, what happens to the dots? They're all moving away from each other. The fact that the clusters of galaxies were moving away from each other could only indicate that the space itself was becoming larger. The universe was expanding. In fact, uh, uh, I don't know if uh, Hubble had read the Quran, but he might have found out from Surah 51, verse number 47, that in fact the universe is expanding. There, the Quran says, Was sama'a As for the heavens, we created it with power, and we are expanding it. 
What uh, Hubble and others came to realize then was that the universe is expanding. But then, if the universe is expanding, it means that tomorrow is going to be larger than it is today. And the day after it's going to be larger still. And the next day, even bigger than before. But then we can also think what might have happened yesterday. Yesterday it must have been smaller than it was today. And the day before it would have been smaller still. And the day before that even smaller still. Until if we go back many billions of years into the past, we can imagine a time when scientists tell us that the entire universe, vast as it is now, was all packed into the space the size of a beach ball. Now I know that's unimaginable, but that's what is commonly believed now. And if you go even further back than that, everything would have been packed into the size of a basketball. And then everything into the size of a cricket ball. And then into the size of a ping pong ball. And then even into the size of a pea. Until a pinhead. And eventually, nothing. So we're back where we started. How did everything come into being from nothing? From nothing, nothing comes. Why do we have something instead of nothing? We have here a re-emphasis on the original idea that we needed a creator to bring everything into existence. Many scientists resisted this view. This view is commonly referred to now as the Big Bang Theory uh, of the origin of the universe. How did they get this name, the Big Bang Theory? Actually, somebody said it by way of derision didn't like this theory. A man by the name of uh, Fred Hoyle. Uh, Fred Hoyle, once on a, a television interview, referring to this theory of the origin of the universe, not liking it because he himself subscribed to this Teddy State theory, referred to it as this Big Bang theory of the origin of the universe. To deride it, but then the name stuck. And people came to refer to it as the Big Bang theory of the origin of the universe. A man by the name of Robert Jastrow is, a, is a, an, a NASA scientist. He wrote a book entitled God and the Astronomers. In that book he said that when it was first discovered that in fact the universe is expanding, scientists resisted this idea. Many resisted the idea. And we can see why. Because this idea implies that there is a God who brought everything into existence. If you have the universe coming about from nothing, then there must have been a God who created everything. Scientists resisted the idea. Albert Einstein himself, famous as he was, intelligent, and quite a genius that we recognize him for, introduced into his equations what he called the cosmological constants. Because to him, his equations implied that the universe was expanding. But instead of accepting the implication from his equations, he tried to fix the equations by putting in there what he called the cosmological constant to stop the universe from expanding. But of course the universe didn't listen to Einstein, the universe kept expanding. Now in hindsight, Einstein looking back at that cosmological constant, once the theory of the Big Bang universe, uh, the Big Bang origin of the universe uh, became more firmly placed, Einstein looked back at that and he called that one of his biggest uh, and most embarrassing blunders. Cosmological constant. So folks, the expanding universe is that evidence that in fact God does exist. But what else can we know about this God? Is it just some impersonal force, some unintelligent uh, being? Could the universe have come together by a chance from some impersonal force out there? Even this too is an idea that must be discarded by modern scientists. Nowadays it is uh, recognized that at the moment of the Big Bang, all of the four physical constants that govern the universe were precisely fine-tuned. And that could only speak to the presence of a fine-tuner, a designer, a fashioner, an intelligent creator. Scientists tell us now that the force of gravity, electromagnetism, the strong and the weak nuclear forces, all of these were precisely fine-tuned right from the very start. Had it not been worked out from the very start, the universe as we have it now would not exist and we wouldn't be here. 
Brandon Carter, an American scientist speaking at a, a conference of astronomers in Poland, in 1974 put forward what he referred to as the anthropic principle. That is the principle he said that, that is recognized now that it seems that the entire universe was so shaped, so designed in order to guarantee that at the end stage human beings would be able to live on a planet called Earth. It's recognized now as the anthropic principle. If these four physical constants were precisely fine-tuned right from the very start, I ask you folks, which master mathematician was there to work out these right to the umpteen decimal places? Hadn't been worked out, we'd have no universe. But the universe is so designed to make sure that human beings would live on planet Earth in the end stage of the universe. Remarkable information showing that in fact God exists. I'd like to advance a further argument that God does exist. And this argument has to do with the, the presence of the glorious Quran as a revealed book to humankind. Now you might say, well this is uh, remarkable. How could it, the presence of a book prove that God exists? And yet it can. Although there have been millions of books written in the world, the Quran occupies a very unique and privileged position. The Quran alone can claim that this book and this book alone is inimitable. Nobody can author a book like it. Nobody can author even a surah, one part like one of its 414 parts. Why is this? Why is the Quran so remarkable? And how is this a proof, a further proof that God does exist? I'd like to take you back to 1400 years ago. And there lives in the Arabian desert a man by the name of uh, Muhammad. After whose name we say peace and blessings of God be upon him. He began to receive extraordinary revelations. When he was about 40 years old he was meditating in a cave when uh, an angel came to him and started reciting some words to him, commanding him to repeat these words. The angel kept coming to him again and again as long as he lived, over the next period of 22 to 23 years. And the angel kept giving him more and more of these bits and pieces of revelation over time, until the book that we call today the Glorious Quran is a collection of all of those bits and pieces revealed over the 23 years. Now how can we know that this book is not the product of Muhammad's own thinking? How can we know that this book is not the work of his own hands and the imaginations of his own mind? First, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as far as we can tell from history, was unlettered. He was not trained to read or write. He could not compose anything more than his own name, much less a paragraph, much less a book, and much less a book like the glorious Qur'an, which, as we see now, is a comprehensive guide for every aspect of human endeavor, whether it be personal, whether it be family, whether it be uh, economic, whether it be social, whether it be political, whether it has to do with international affairs. All of that is covered in the one book, that Qur'an. That could not have been the work of this man. Second, the sincerity of this man would not allow him to uh, claim that the Quran came to him from God if indeed it were his own production. In fact, non-Muslim historians reviewing the life of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him also conclude that he was sincere. When he said that the Quran came to him from God, it really was his sincere belief that this was so. A number of things point in this way. First, he had no motive for telling a lie. He refused wealth, he refused power. He was offered these things to distract him from preaching his message, but he refused these offers. He himself did not seek wealth, but whatever wealth he had, he spent that in the mission. He did not desire power. When he sat among his companions, he was indistinguishable from the rest. Somebody visiting, trying to find out who is this Muhammad we used to hear about, they wouldn't be able to pick him out from the crowd because he blended in as one of the, as of the common folk. On occasion he was found sleeping under a tree, a humble man not surrounded by guards like the kings of his day. 
He was a man who has gone down in history as one who mended his own shoes, stitched his own clothing, and assisted in the household chores. He told his uh, disciples and his followers, do not uh, praise me. Do not exaggerate in praising me as others have exaggerated in praising the prophets before me. No, he was an honest and truthful and trustworthy person. Even his uh, contemporaries, enemies of his contemporaries, his enemies from among his contemporaries, called him names like Al-Amin and As-Sadiq, which means uh, the trustworthy and the truthful one. So he was not one to tell a lie. Historians have to agree that he was sincere. But now, someone may ask, suppose he was sincere. He believed that this revelation was coming to him from outside, that this was a revelation from the Almighty God to him. Is it possible that he might have been sincerely wrong? Is it possible that perhaps he convinced himself that the message was from outside, whereas in fact the message was from inside? Is it possible that this is his own wording? This is his own thoughts and imaginations coming, welling up, and now exiting from his mouth as the glorious Qur'an. And I'd like to explore some reasons why we should think that this is not the case. That in fact, not only was he sincere, but he was sincerely right. The third uh, reason I'd like to look at now is uh, the, uh, to do with the psychology. The psychology of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If you read the text of the Qur'an, you will see that the Qur'an actually speaks to Muhammad, commands him, and on occasion even criticizes him. Now, who can offer a book like that? Which pretends to be from outside, and is criticizing the author in the meantime. For the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to have written something like that, he would have had to be slightly deranged. Imagine him writing a book in which he's criticizing himself. Now I know folks, you often talk to yourselves, don't you? But if you argue with yourself and actually lose, you need help. If the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had authored this book, he would have been a sort of a madman. But if he was a madman, then he could not have authored a book like the Glorious Qur'an. And we must conclude that he did not author this book, but this was revealed to him from the Almighty God. The fourth reason I'd like to look at is uh, one having to do with history. We see what the Qur'an says about past history, often detailing things that were not known to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or to his contemporaries, and yet independent investigations prove that the history in the Qur'an is actually true. Now who could have revealed that information? It could not have come from a person's own subconscious because we're dealing with specific items of past history. And then the fifth reason that I'd like to offer has to do with the future, prophecy. The Quran says certain things about the future and then the future unfolds exactly as already predicted in the Quran. Now who can offer a book about the future and let the future obey that book? Unless this is a revelation from the Almighty God. The sixth reason I'd like to offer is uh, one having to do with science. We can see that the Quran describes many aspects of physical nature, telling us about the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the earth, and even telling us about ourselves. The Quran goes into such detail that it tells us even about the growth and development of the human embryo. It is not the purpose of the Quran to discuss and describe science, but the purpose of the Quran is to draw man's attention to the God who created them. And in doing so, the Quran reminds us about our humble origins as we grew and developed in the wombs of our mothers. And in doing so, the Quran describes the very early moments of the formation of the human embryo. Now, modern scientists, looking at the descriptions which are found in the Qur'an, uh, find that these descriptions are extremely accurate, and that they're amazing to be found in a 7th century book. For example, Dr. Keith Moore, professor of embryology and chairman of that department at the University of Toronto, author of the textbook, The Developing Human, a textbook which is used by uh, students of embryology throughout the Western world, studied in universities, just like your own here. Dr. Moore is a true expert in his field. After he had studied some statements in the Quran regarding the growth and development of the human embryo, he concluded that these statements are remarkably accurate. And he said that he hopes the agreement that he has found 
between the Quran and modern science will help to close the gap between religion and science which has existed for so many years. In fact, he even went into detail to tell us that some of the descriptions which are given in the Quran contain information that could not have been discovered prior to the invention of the microscope. And he reminds us that the microscope was invented a full thousand years after the Quran had already been available. So then who could have authored a book like this? We have here evidence, we've looked at six pieces of evidence so far uh, to show that the Quran is actually the Word of God. When the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said that the Quran was being revealed to him from the Almighty God, we would want to find a human explanation for this book. We might want to think that perhaps Muhammad on whom be peace authored this book. Perhaps it came from his own mind, but as we can see now it didn't come from his own mind. One might want to wonder, did he perhaps learn it from some other people or from some other sources or from some bits of his information that were available in his day and we can see now that no he couldn't have learned it from any such source so then the six reasons we have looked at so far would confirm that the Quran is the Word of God and if the Quran is the Word of God then we have here another argument for the existence of God but I'd like to look at two other reasons Two other reasons which would confirm the other six. These are reasons that we found when we try to look at the Quran the other way around. We have looked at positive reasons to show that the Quran is the Word of God. But is there any way of disproving it had it not been the Word of God? Many students of science will say that a scientific theory is not a scientific theory unless there is a way in which it can be falsified if it were not true. There has to be a way of disproving it. The Quran itself, folks, let me surprise you. The Quran itself offers you two ways of trying to disprove it. So confident is the Quran in its claim that this is the word of God, that it offers you challenge number one. Find errors in this book. In Surah 4, verse number 82, it says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Have they not considered the Qur'an with care? وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Had it been from any other than God, they would have found therein much discrepancy. The Qur'an is daring humankind. Find errors in this book to prove that it is not the Word of God. Because had it not been the Word of God, you would have found therein much discrepancy. Many people have wasted their lives trying to find errors in the Qur'an. But nobody has been able to come up with anything that is a genuine example of an error in the Qur'an. They have come up sometimes with examples of their own misunderstanding of the book. But nothing of a genuine error. Who could have authored this book? Challenge number two from the Qur'an is produce a book like this one. Just show that it is possible to do it. If you claim, as some do, that the Prophet Muhammad al whom be peace authored this book, then you imply that it is a human production. But if a human can do it, some other humans can do another one. If somebody invents Pepsi, somebody else can come up with Coke. Someone invents 7-Up, someone can come up with Sprite. But why is it that in the history of the world, there have been many millions of books written but not another one like the Qur'an. And the Qur'an dares to proclaim, look, if you think that this book is not from God, produce another one like it. If not the entire book, produce just one surah like it, just one. The Qur'an is comprised of 114 surahs, so the challenge is to produce just one part like one of its parts, to match its beauty, its eloquence, and its wisdom. And nobody has been able to come up with something like this. So by way of confirmation, we have looked at the two challenges and we have seen that in fact, the Quran is the Word of God. We have looked at six positive reasons and we have looked at two negative reasons to show that in fact, the Quran is what it says that it is. Now if the Quran is what it says that it is, then what do we have here? We have here a third argument 
for the existence of God. Remember we said first the cosmological argument, the fact that we needed a God to bring everything into existence. Second, we looked at uh, the teleological argument or the argument from design. We've seen that everything must have been designed precisely from the start. All the four physical constants were precisely worked out from the beginning, otherwise we wouldn't be here. And now we've looked at the Qur'an as a book from God, a revelation from Him, giving us further confidence that in fact God does exist. Now I don't have further time in this lecture folks, otherwise I would go into more detail on the things that we notice around us and how this lends a further argument to show that God does exist. I would go into a refutation of the theory of evolution and I would show you how in modern times Brother Abu Muntasir has generously offered part of his time to allow me to continue and, and offer you uh, some more of this juicy stuff. I'd like to thank him for that and I would like to thank you for your rapt attention. I think he must have noticed that you, you are drinking in the information and if that is so then I think the credit goes to you. If I were to continue then, what I would want to look at now is the more on the argument from design. You know, wherever we look around, we see that everything is precisely designed. And in modern times, scientists have looked at this and they have said, oh, it only has the appearance of being designed. But what they say in fact, that what appears to be designed, is not really designed. It just arrived there by chance. They have said that if you start off with something very simple and if you add a small increment of improvement to it and then a small increment more of improvement to that improvement, all of the increments will eventually add up until you can have something that appears to be designed. I would like to look at both sides of this argument. I'd like to first look at the argument from design to show that in fact things are precisely designed and then we will look at the counter-argument from modern scientists to show that things have evolved over time through the random processes of uh, blind mutation. First, if we look at things, whether big or small, we notice that everything is working harmoniously. We notice, for example, that uh, the Earth is spinning on its axis. We notice that the Earth is going around the Sun. We notice that the Sun is only a part of a larger system, the Milky Way galaxy. And the Sun is also rotating along with the Milky Way galaxy. But we notice that the Milky Way galaxy is only one part of a large uh, superstructure, a cluster of galaxies. And galaxies are only parts of super clusters. But then these super clusters are not just simply arranged randomly. Scientists tell us that they are organized in a particular way as if they were grapes on a bunch. Wherever we look, we see that there are elements of design. It is not just simply the things are thrown about any old way. You look at the sunrise and you look at the sunset. Sure enough, we need the sun for warmth. But is that all that we need? Does humankind have an appreciation for beauty? Yes. When we select our clothing, we want clothing that will keep us warm. But at the same time, we look for styles, for designs, for fashions, things that will have some appearance of beauty. Now I know Shakespeare said that beauty is only in the eyes of the beholder. What you select as looking very nice may not actually look very nice to another person. But that's another matter. The fact is that we do have an appreciation for beauty. And in fact, the sisters have more of an appreciation for beauty. And often the sisters complain that, you know, after wearing this nice dress, and the husband looks at her as though she hasn't done anything different. Because she has more of an appreciation for beauty. You know, she puts on this nice dress, she expects now the husband is going to say, darling, you look more beautiful than before. <laughs> but, you know, he just says, okay, we just got two minutes more, are you hurrying up? So we have this appreciation for beauty. And then we can see now, not only do we have the sunrise and the, and the sunset, the warmth of the sun, they give us the life-giving energy that is necessary for the continuation of vegetation and of all life. But we also have beauty. You look at the sunrise in the morning, it's beautiful. You look at the sunset at night, 
It is beautiful. Whoever placed that there for us, folks, made sure not only that it will give us the warmth that we need, but also the beauty that we appreciate. Everywhere we see that things are designed. If you look at the way that uh, the tiny ants operate, you see that they operate in a very structured manner. You see that uh, they form actually a community. You see that birds actually fly in formation. Although birds sometimes do not have the, the brain power to work out their flights, their navigational uh, distances, and their maps and patterns, yet some birds amaze us with their flight patterns. There's one particular bird that flies over the Atlantic in the shape of an eight and arrives back to where it began. There is a certain uh, bird which uh, was tested or taken from Wales into America and these birds were able to fly back precisely to where they began. We see that the penguins in Australia have a very sophisticated pattern the manner in which they bring up their young. You will find that the male penguin will stand there holding an egg with a slight fold of skin just going over the egg to keep that egg warm. The male penguin will stay there for a long time until the female penguin goes out into sea and uh, gathers fish and feeds herself and so on. And then the female penguin comes back just in time when the baby penguin hatches. How the mother penguin knows exactly when is this time is beyond imagination. But if she comes back too late, the baby would die of starvation. But she comes back just in time to feed that baby regurgitated fish. And then she takes her turn looking after the baby. The male penguin then goes out to sea and uh, gorges itself on fish and comes back again just in time to feed this baby before the baby could die. This sophisticated and complex pattern that we notice in the natural world is an appearance of design, they say. But we can see that it is design. You look at uh, the woodpecker. The woodpecker is an amazing example of uh, the way that things are designed. The woodpecker, in order to get his uh, food, actually uh, has to drill a hole into the barks of the trees. Because the woodpecker is going to eat the insects and little creatures that live in the trunks of trees. Now for the woodpecker, to be able to get its lunch, the woodpecker has to be specifically designed for what it does. The woodpecker has to be able to perch upon a tree upright like that. Most, most birds would perch on a branch and their feet are designed to perch so. But the woodpecker's toes have two pointing forward and two pointing backward in order to allow it to grip itself upon that tree. Not only that, but the woodpecker has tubby tail feathers that will allow it to brace itself against that tree so it does and fall over. Now the next stage is for the woodpecker to actually drill a hole into that tree. And uh, if most birds were to, you know, go banging its beak against the tree like that, it would get a headache in two seconds flat. But uh, Woody Woodpecker has a soft spongy tissue between the beak and its head. So that acts as a shock absorber. And it's guaranteed for as long as the woodpecker owns its beak. So the woodpecker would go drilling away until it pokes that hole. But that's not the end of the story because for the woodpecker to be able to get its lunch, it has to have a long enough tongue to be able to go into the cracks and crevices and eat the insects. And woodpecker also has that. Most birds have their tongues uh, fastened to the backs of their mouths, but the woodpecker's tongue actually coils around and goes around and attaches to the top of the head. So there's a long enough tongue when it stretches out the woodpecker can actually get its lunch. You can see, folks, that if any one of these four pieces of design were missing, if the woodpecker didn't have the precise uh, way of gripping the tree, if it didn't have the toes made for that, if it didn't have the stubby tail feathers, if it didn't have the shock absorber behind its beak, if it didn't have the long enough tongue, any one of these four things missing, the woodpecker wouldn't get its lunch. And it would die before evolving into something else.
no matter where we look, we see that there are examples of design. You look at the human eye. Amazing. It's precisely designed. Modern cameras are fashioned after the pattern of the human eye. But who designed the human eye in the first place? What intelligent being was out there to design the human eye? Charles Darwin in 1859 published his book the Ar on the origin of species by means of natural selection. He admitted at that time that the presence of something as complex as the eye is one of the gravest challenges to his theory. But what Charles Darwin hoped to show is that in fact very complex things can come about through very small variations over time. I want to say that what appears to be designed is not actually designed, but came about through blind processes of random change and natural selection. What they say is that if you add a small beneficial increment to any organism, then that organism gets better. If you add another small beneficial increment, that organism gets better still, and better still, and better still, until a very simple organism can become indeed very complex, finally. But in order to demonstrate this theory, one has to deal with a number of problems. First of all, one starts with the assumption that there is no God. The very theory of evolution was constructed in order to explain the diversity of life without invoking God. It's as if to say, let's explain how life evolves over time, but imagine first of all that there is no God. You see, if you imagine that there is a God to start with, then it becomes easy to explain the diversity of life. You see that things appear very complex and very structured, very much designed. Once you see that things have the appearance of design, if you imagine that there is a God, then it's easy to understand how things achieve such complex designs. Obviously because there is a God who created and fashioned everything. But if you say, no, there is no God, then you have to explain. How did all of these things come about? If you imagine that this building was constructed, designed by architects and engineers working in cohesion and harmony with each other, if you imagine that this building was designed by some intelligent beings, then it's easy to explain why the windows are square. It is easy to explain why these little things are round. It is easy to explain why the signs make sense. But if you imagine that there is no designer, no fashioner, no creator, no architects, no engineers, then you have a lot of explaining to do. And then you come up with stories. And the stories that have been come up, that have been brought up in the science of evolution, or rather the theory of evolution, are of this particular nature. I'd like to look at uh, a very narrow part of that story so that we can bring this lecture to a close. Scientists have said that human beings evolved from apes. And in order to prove this, what they want to show is that if you start with an ape-like being, and if you change that being a little bit, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more, eventually you can get a human being at the end. Now, there is some plausibility in that argument. There would be no plausibility in saying that an ape gave birth to a human baby, because we know that such nonsense doesn't occur. But what they have said is that if an ape gives birth to a baby that is slightly different than the ape, and then the baby is slightly different still, how different? Only as different as your ch children are different from you. Someone might see the resemblance, but there might be a little bit of difference between you and your son, or mother and daughter. So if there is a slight difference between ape and ape child, and then ape grandchild, and then ape great grandchild. Eventually, all of these little differences can add up to big differences over time. There is some plausibility in that argument. But for that to happen, imagine the consequences. It would mean that between ape and man, there are millions of intermediate beings. Each one just slightly, ever so slightly different than the one that came before it. 
one beside its neighbor will not appear to be very different. But if you look at the one at the start of the series and the one at the end of the series, that's where you see the big difference. You see ape on one side, man on the other side. Two beside each other, not very different. Maybe in the middle you might have ape man. But where are these beings? When Darwin wrote in 1859, he realized that these beings do not exist anywhere. But he hoped that these beings have existed in the past, now laying buried in the earth. And he hoped that the fossilized remains of these intermediate beings would one day be found. After 130 years of digging, folks, the missing links between ape and man are still missing. For that theory to have been true, those missing links would have to be somewhere. But they are nowhere. And in desperation, scientists have come up with certain things to try and show that missing links did actually exist. For example, they came up with what is referred to as Piltdown Man. At Piltdown in Essex in 1912 was discovered an amazing finding. What appeared to be a cross between a man and an ape. It appeared to have the skull of a man, but the jawbone of an ape. And this was said to be an intermediate being. It was held up by the scientific community of Britain for 40 years. And of course replicas of it were transported to different parts of the world. Paintings of it uh, appeared on, uh, in newspapers, uh, not on television yet, but uh, on uh, museum displays everywhere. Students were convinced that here we have a cross between ape and man, a midway point, halfway between ape and man. But then in 1952, some further tests were done on this Piltdown man, and it was found that this was neither a man nor an ape. What had actually happened was that somebody had taken together and fixed together the skull of a man with the jawbone of an orangutan and had chemically aged these bones in order to give them the appearance of ancient age. It was a fraud. But for 40 years, this was used as a proof for evolution that man descended from the apes. But once it has been shown for 40 years, you know what that does to students? It convinces everyone that, yeah, this is how it is. The images, the drawings, the paintings, the museum displays out there have helped to convince people over time that in fact evolution is true. But the proof for evolution, I promise you, has never been found. And we must revert to the idea that there is a God who created and fashioned and designed everything. Now for a long time, Neanderthal man was shown to be a missing link between ape and man. And Neanderthal man was often showed with a very kind of uh, brutish appearance. He looks like he might be an ape and, you know, he walks in a kind of a hunched over fashion. But Neanderthal man now has been reappraised. And it has been found that Neanderthal man was much misunderstood. It so happens that the first specimens of what is called Neanderthal man that were discovered in the Neanderthal Valley in uh, Germany actually uh, were specimens of some human beings who suffered from rickets. And because of their disease, they had this kind of hunched over appearance. They were not hunched over because they were a family, but they were hunched over because human beings as they were, they were suffering from rickets. Today it is thought that if Neanderthal man was given a shave, if he was dressed up in a three-piece suit, and if he was placed on the New York subway, nobody would pay second notice to him. He would just blend in with the crowd. Neanderthal man was very much 
a human being. Cro-Magnon man was often proposed as an intermediate between modern man and ancient uh, apes. But in fact, Cro-Magnon man today is said to be identical with modern man. So all of the missing links, all of the links that they have put as found links over time, one by one are reclassified and shown to be not missing links at all. In desperation, people have come up with one thing or another. Not only Piltdown Man, but uh, Nebraska Man. And scientists give these things very fancy names. They could have just called it Nebraska Man from Nebraska where it was supposedly found. But they call this the uh, Hesperopithecus Harold Cookie. <laughs> yeah, if you give a big Latin name like that, it sounds uh, scientific. I think it's the same thing, you know, if you go to your doctor and he gives you something with a simple sounding name, you might say, well, I could have bought that off the counter. But he gives you one with a big Latin name, so you never figure out you could have bought that off the counter. You think, yeah, this doctor is good. <laughs> now, Nebraska man was uh, immediately publicized all over, discovered in Nebraska. This is the, you know, ape man we've been looking for. Newspaper articles, magazines, everywhere. But then it was uh, reappraised. And it was found that in fact, uh, you know, all of these drawings of Nebraska man with the long hair and his uh, wife beside him and his kids and the kind of tools that he used to use and all of that. All of these drawings were just the imaginations of scientists. All of these drawings were just based on a very simple finding, the discovery of one tooth. And then further investigation showed that actually this tooth had belonged to an extinct form of wild pig. So these displays, these uh, drawings, these illustrations, all of the textbooks that have been uh, drilled into us over time uh, will sometimes make people convinced that in fact evolution did occur. But folks, I'm here to tell you that from my review of the materials, I have not found evidence that evolution has occurred. I'd like to tell you one more thing about these illustrations, how widespread they have become. In recent times, uh, in, uh, in Toronto, there was a move from the city authorities to help people to think more in terms of being clean. Tidy up the city, you know, throwing the garbage in the right place. Make sure it gets right there in the can. And so they show these pictures of, uh, you know, a series of beings. You have on the one end uh, the hunched over ape, and then a little bit further, you know, he's standing a little bit more upright, and then a little bit more upright, and then finally at the end you have the upright man. And what does he do? He throws the waste right into the litter basket. This is the kind of imagery that has been fed to people over time. But the intermediate links has not been found and cannot be found. In fact, in modern times, there has arisen among scientists a new trend. Remember we said previously that if anyone said that an ape had given birth to a human baby, we would say that is nonsense, and such nonsense doesn't occur. But in modern times, there has arisen among scientists a new trend to think that this kind of gradual progression over time that Darwin spoke about is not really true. It didn't occur that way. Niles Eldridge and Stephen J. Gould are two scientists who are most prominent and most well known for this particular way of looking at things. And what they have proposed is uh, what they refer to as punctuated equilibrium. They say that when we look at the fossil record, when we look at all of the old fossils that have been dug up from the earth, when we look at how beings used to be in the earth, we notice that in fact it looks like the beings just were stable for a long time. There might have been some changes among them, but only some very minute and gradual changes up to a certain point, and then they stop changing. And then they say that there is a sudden leap, there is a sudden jump, to something new. So there is a, an equilibrium and that is suddenly punctuated by a sudden leap. They refer to the theory as punctuated equilibrium. But what do you mean by a sudden leap? You mean back again that something gave birth to something extraordinarily new and very different. In order to explain this kind of sudden leap, a scientist by the name of Richard Goldschmidt 
trying to explain how birds must have come about. The common theory was that birds came from dinosaurs. Looking at the uh, structure of birds, one can see some similarity with lizards. And it is thought that perhaps birds came from dinosaurs. Perhaps bird, bird feathers came from dinosaur scales. But how did birds come about? You should have a gradual progression from dinosaur to bird, from lizard to bird. You should have an emergence of feathers coming from scales. You should have something that is half scale, half feather. You should have something that is half bird, half dinosaur. Where are these things? There are nowhere. So Richard Goldschmidt, in order to explain the presence of birds, said that uh, it must have happened this way, that a dinosaur laid an egg, and uh, out of that egg hatched a bird. Now, in desperation, scientists are going back to the same thing which you are now laughing at. Because the proof for that gradual evolution that they spoke about is just simply not there. Men and women of understanding, I'd like to put before you today that every one of you is a proof of the existence of God. Because you have been designed, you have been fashioned, you have been engineered. And when scientists try to tell us that no, we came from a stock, they're trying to deny this obvious sign of design. Your two eyes are amazing examples of engineering design. The fact that your hair grows on your head, the fact that your fingernails grow right in the right place and not on your head, are proof of engineering design. Do you know that all of this is worked out right from the very beginning? All of this is programmed in your DNA. At what age will your voices change? At what age would the sisters notice changes in their bodies? Uh, where would the fingernails grow? If you lose a certain part of your, of, of your skin, how would that skin regrow? All of that is precisely worked out and already designed from the very start. Every one of you is a proof that God exists. And as much as scientists would like to deny that today, there are also many other scientists who are still believers in God. Many scientists in modern times have come to be disbelievers and they've come up with these theories because they have not come to accept and believe in God. They might have inherited a religious tradition which made them turn away from God. They might have come in the enlightenment period of Europe to reject God. They might have thought that, look, the Bible says one thing but science says another thing. I must embrace science and I must give up the Bible. There came to be a rift between science and uh, the church. Ever since Galileo, people have turned away from religion in order to embrace science. But in the Muslim world, scientists who were studying the glorious Quran had no reason to reject the Quran in favor of science, but they had reason to be stimulated by the Quran in order to do more science. And so Muslim scientists went ahead making advances in every field of science and technology, medicine and civilization. In terms of technology and medicine, we see that many Muslim scientists uh, worked and made advances in, in mathematics, in physics, in optics, in astronomy, in medicine. Ar-Razi was the first person to diagnose uh, smallpox and his uh, writing on smallpox uh, has been in use for 300 years after him by the Western world. The Muslim scientists in the heyday of Islam actually were motivated by the Quran to do science because the Quran tells us to think, to reflect, to study, to understand. And Muslim scientists understanding from the Quran that the world is governed by a God who puts things in organized and measured fashions were prompted to discover what are these measurements when the Quran tells us that the sun and the moon husband, are subject to measurements Muslim scientists would be prompted to find out what are these measurements when in Europe it was thought that the earth was flat Muslim scientists were making advances in studying the earth students of Islam were already studying the globe using globes as models for the earth in Muslim Spain. So we can see that in fact Muslims have no reason to abandon the idea that there is a God. Muslims have no reason to adopt theories like the theory of evolution, whether gradual or by punctuated equilibrium, or whether to say that uh, birds came out of dinosaur eggs. Muslims, having confidence that we have here, the Book of God, the glorious Quran, can now submit themselves 
to the one God. In this lecture, folks, we have seen that there is, in modern times, a tendency to reject God and to think that we may as well live our lives without God. To think that maybe there is a God, but he doesn't concern himself with what goes on here. And we have seen in this lecture that in fact that God does concern, God does concern himself with what goes on here. How do we know that? Because he revealed a book, the glorious Quran. And that book, that book is a manual for how to operate your life. We've seen that every one of you is a product of very precise arrangement, design, and molding. So who molded us? Who fashioned us? Who designed us? And for what purpose? That Quran, that book of God, is here to tell us. So we've seen that there is evidence now that God does exist. And the Quran is an evidence not only that God exists, but that He has a plan for us. And I invite every man and woman in this room to fulfill that plan. To satisfy the purpose for which you have been created. Fulfill your function before you fail to function. Before death, we must please God. We have a purpose. And what do we do with things that do not fulfill the purposes for which we make them? If you have a clock, it's made to tell time. What do you do with a broken clock? You try to fix it. If it won't be fixed, eventually you discard it. Now I don't know how the garbage is dealt with in this country, but I see in Canada what they do is, you know, first of all we throw the garbage into very big garbage bins. And then every once in a while the city truck comes along and it has this kind of fork that picks up that bin, turns it all the way over and dumps the garbage into the back of the truck. And then this huge crusher comes down and compacts everything, pressing it down. And then all that garbage is taken to the incinerator for burning. Well, I don't know if something like that is done in this country, but when I saw that happen, and I was reading a verse from the Quran one day, I started putting two and two together. What will happen to human garbage? Allah says, Kalla, la fil No, but he will be thrown into the crusher. And what will explain to you what the crusher is? It is the fire of Allah already kindled. That which rises above the hearts of people. In pillars, they will be placed for punishment. Men and women of understanding, as we have seen today the evidence that there is a God, and we, as we have seen that there is a book which came from God as an owner's manual on how to operate your life, how to fulfill the purpose for which God created you, I'd invite every man and woman in this room to accept that message from God to submit yourselves to God, to say, yes, God, if you are there, I believe you. If the Quran really is your book, then I want to accept it and live my life according to that book. I'd invite you now, if you haven't already accepted the Quran, to come forward and try to learn more about that book and to accept it, to declare your faith in it even today. And for those of you who have already accepted this book as the manual to govern your lives, I'd like to ask you, brothers and sisters, to what extent have you allowed that book to govern your lives? Have you allowed it partially or completely? Allow it to govern your lives completely. Thank you very much. الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وأن معهم إلى يوم الدين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد I praise Allah I glorify Him I thank Him for all his favors and bounties upon us. I seek his help in all our affairs 
and we ask him to make us firm on the path of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I think perhaps uh, in future when we organize events like this we need to plan it out a bit better and take into account the usefulness of the speakers whom we are inviting. And I would have thought perhaps Brother Shabir Ali would have been enough by himself to do the entire session anyway without even attempting to bring other speakers in the first place. It's not trying to put the organizers down. And I just feel that perhaps if he take a break for about five, ten minutes and give him ample time to address the second lecture, which is to do with Islam's relationship with uh, other religions, vis-a-vis -vis other religions, that would be more beneficial than trying to cram three lectures into one and not covering any topic in sufficient detail. I found the lecture extremely scintillating and inspiring, more than a, fresh, a breath of fresh air. I don't know how you feel. And I would propose that we break for about 5-10 minutes, inshallah, and he continues with the second lecture, and then we have at least enough time to satisfy some of the questions. You have heard me speak before in this assembly or this type of gathering, and I'm always, I can always come back later, inshallah, as being a local to England. And he's flown all the way from Canada, so I think that should be the format. And I apologize if there are some brothers and sisters who expected to hear something from me, perhaps a later time, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Subhanakullah wa bihamdu shukrullah. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulih al-kareem. I'd like to just take you on a brief tour around the, the world to examine the world's major religions in a quick survey. If we start with the Far East, we encounter Japan. In Japan, there is a religion known as uh, Shintoism. This is a religion that is indigenous to Japan and it's very difficult to transport and export out of Japan. It has to do more with the origins of Japan and the origins of the Japanese people and why the Japanese people are so special. And you can see why then that would be difficult to export away from Japan. In fact, uh, their mythology actually explains how the Japanese islands came to be in the first place. It is said that uh, two gods, the male and the female, Izanagi and uh, Izanami, mated. Uh, Izanami became pregnant and uh, she gave birth to the islands of Japan. So that uh, religion, as you can see, is um, quite uh, mythological and a lot of the religions that we will encounter has um, a lot of mythology as the basis on which um, their uh, theology and ideologies are formed. If we come a little bit uh, uh, east, uh, a little bit west from that, but in the same region, we encounter the religions of, uh, of China uh, and uh, of Taiwan. There we encounter uh, Confucianism and Taoism. Confucianism and Taoism are said to be more philosophies than religions. Confucianism was started out uh, in the uh, 6th century BC uh, by a man, Kung Fu Tzu, who had a kind of uh, ethical system that he wanted to promote. He noticed that there are a number of problems that are faced in the community uh, with uh, people being at war and in antagonism with each other. He felt that uh, the way around this problem was to promote uh, what he called gentlemanliness. Uh, so he tried to teach people how to be better citizens, in other words. How to be good in relationship to your king or to your subjects. How to be good to your wives or to your husbands, uh, to your parents or to your children. How to be a good friend uh, and a good gentleman. Uh, this is what uh, Confucius actually uh, came up with, a kind of ethical system. We would see that uh, in Islam, ethics is one part of Islam. Islam seeks to be a holistic approach to life rather than just simply one compartment uh, out of life. And it would seem to me that Confucianism is just one compartment, how to be good citizens, how to practice good ethics and be a good gentleman. Uh, Taoism also is a kind of philosophy on life. Uh, in fact, uh, Taoism uh, sees that uh, nature is ideal the way it is and you should not try to change nature or go against the grain but you should try to go with the flow as they say in modern America go with the flow of things uh, so you try to achieve harmony with nature 
Uh, th it is said that uh, even the th when things look very bleak, there might be some good in that, and even when things look uh, good, there might be some bad in it, and you never know in advance what is good and uh, what is bad. A story is told to illustrate this, and the, the illustration actually will remind Muslims of the fact that Allah is uh, a, uh, a is, is the controller of everything, and everything happens only according to his uh, will. The story goes that uh, there was a farmer uh, who uh, lost his horse, so his neighbors came over to commiserate with him because he lost his horse. Uh, but uh, he said, well, who knows what is good and wh what is bad. But the next day his horse came back, bringing with it uh, some other wild horses that uh, this horse had befriended in the meantime. So now the farmer had gained some horses. So his neighbors came over to commiserate with him. But he said, well, who knows what is good and what is bad. But what his son tried to ride one of the wild horses and he fell down and broke his leg. And again the neighbors came over to commiserate with him because his son had broken his leg. But the farmer just simply said, well, who knows what is good and what is bad. Now, in those days, people, of course, uh, didn't like for their sons to be drafted into the army. And uh, the army personnel came knocking on this farmer's door for his son. But when they found that his son had a broken leg, they left him alone. And so the farmer was happy that he had his son left. And the moral of the story is, who knows really what is good and what is bad. But this story, of course, reminds Muslims that God, Allah, is in control of everything. And we can see that this one uh, philosophical insight that is there in Taoism is, again, that is part of Islam. Many people think today that many religions teach good things. And what is surprising for many researchers on the world's major religions is to find that Islam is such a combination of all the good that we can find anywhere. And in fact, a Muslim is not... Uh, surprised to find good because the Muslim believes that God has revealed prophets and, and messengers to many different, has sent prophets and messengers to many different people over time. Uh, so that everyone could hear the message that there is only one God, you should worship Him alone and shun all false gods. Whatever good is there in any religious system, a Muslim is not uh, afraid to find because the Muslim thinks that all good comes actually from God. And uh, if some religious system has some remnants of good, then uh, that uh, would be seen as coming from God. And in fact, the Muslim is delighted to find that the same good is also in the religion of Islam. If we come a little bit west from that, we come into India and we find the, the religions of India. Uh, Hinduism is a number of religions put together under the same single banner known as Hinduism. The name Hinduism itself has to do with the Indus River, which incidentally now is mostly in Pakistan um, rather than in India. But the, the religions of Hinduism get, get, get their name from the fact of the Indus River. From Indus you have Hindus and Hindus, Hinduism. Uh, Hinduism is a collection of mythologies that, that uh, date back to a long time it, and it seems that it, it is such a collection that is a mixture and conglomeration. It seems that uh, native people of India had a number of uh, mythological concepts and then invaders from the north came in, the Aryans, with their own religious ideas and all of these ideas commingled with each other. The people who came in from the north uh, wrote some books which they refer to as the Vedas. And the most ancient of these is referred to as the Rig Vedas. The Rig Vedas are said to be of the oldest among the world's major religious scriptures today. And yet the Rig Vedas, uh, old as it is, might have been a source of pride uh, due to its age. And uh, yet its contents does not give one uh, enough reason to be proud. The Rig Vedas does not uh, function as much as a book of religious guidance. In fact, it tells us about a plurality of gods, some of these gods who are in fact amoral, as it has been said in uh, many religious texts. Indra, for example, uh, is a god who is said to drink Soma. Now, Soma uh, is a kind of hallucinogenic drink. It's, uh, it is pressed from some plants, either from some kind of hallucinogenic mushroom or it might be marijuana. Scholars cannot say for sure what is this Soma. But in any case, it makes the person intoxicated. And it is said that the gods drink this Soma. 
uh, Indra himself drank Soma and eventually he killed his father. So Indra is said to be amoral, he does not subscribe to any set of moral rules and hence he cannot serve as a kind of hero or a, a model for any human being to copy. But the rest of gods too seem to be very mythological. In fact Soma we've seen is a juice that makes a person drunk, but Soma itself, itself is said to be a god. It seems that many of the natural forces and powers are personified into a god. And it is said that Soma fills up the moon, so that's why you have the full moon and then it starts to wane because the gods are drinking up the Soma and then it gets refilled eventually with, uh, with more Soma. Uh, the sun is said to be a god, dawn is said to be a god, you know in the morning the dawn uh, is uh, visible, that is referred to as Usha, the dawn and that is worship, fire is worship and that is said to be the mouthpiece of the god, so if you want to give some food to the god, you put it into the fire. Um, and this is why, of course, they commend uh, cremation, because at death, in order to go to the gods, you go into the fire, and that takes you to the rest of the gods. Uh, this uh, system of belief is uh, based uh, very thoroughly on mythology, and one does not find enough of a reason there to say, well, this is the truth that God has revealed for all time. Uh, many times people think that, well, all religions are just equally the same. In modern times, it has become fashionable to think so. Uh, it is fashionable to think so because in modern times it has come to be thought that religions are worthless. So all religions are equal because all religions are equally worthless. <laughs> but uh, as we study the world's major religions, we realize that in fact all religions are not equal. And uh, while every person has a right to his or her belief, uh, that is between them and God, not between them and us. Uh, while a person has a right to his opinion and one might choose his or her belief and remain on that as they choose, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're on the right belief or that they are on a justifiable belief or that um, they, their belief will have no consequence. In fact, one's belief does have consequence. And uh, as we study the other religions too, we see that a lot of religions are just simply made up by human beings. A lot of times people think that all religions are made up, but no, we have to study the history of the world's religions to find out which ones are made up by human beings and which ones are not. Buddhism as a religion is admittedly made up by a human being. Siddhartha Gautama, the founder of this faith, was in, in fact a Hindu, but in the 6th century BC, he as he lived in that time, became dissatisfied with some of the concepts of Hinduism and he wanted to find his own way through this maze of confusion. And eventually he came up with what he called the Four Noble Truths. He said that, uh, uh, number one, there is suffering everywhere. Everyone ends up in suffering and death. You get into old age and sickness and eventually death. And uh, he said that uh, desire causes suffering. So people suffer because they crave things. You know, if you didn't crave things, you wouldn't suffer. Uh, there is some element of truth in that, but to say that desire is the cause of suffering is a little bit of overstating the case, I think you will agree. But in any case, he said that in, in order to eliminate suffering, we should eliminate desire. And so part of uh, the Buddhist philosophy is uh, the attempt to just simply crush one's desire and annihilate one's self. Uh, some Muslims have also adopted this kind of principle and tried to make that part of Islam, but uh, as we study Islam, we realize that Islam uh, does not subscribe to that. Islam emphasizes both the spirit and the body. As much as we try to be close to God, we should also satisfy the needs and uh, wants of our bodies. Having desire is not entirely bad, and desire doesn't cause suffering unless it is left out of control. So don't crush your desire, don't annihilate and eliminate your desire, keep it, but keep it under control. That is the message of Islam. Uh, so the idea then in, in Buddhism is that you should achieve now uh, nirvana. You should uh, become extinct from yourself, annihilate yourself, thus annihilate and crushing your desires uh, along with yourself and you become free from that. Uh, Buddhism admittedly is made up by a human being and many will say in modern times, well if uh, Siddhartha Gautama can make up his religion, well I can make up my own as well. Why should I follow somebody else's man-made religion? This is the common uh, cry of modern times. If we are going to submit to a religion, if we are going to embrace and adopt a religion in modern times, it had better be a religion not made up by man but revealed by the Almighty God. In, in the Indian subcontinent as well, there emerged eventually in the 16th uh, century uh, CE, a religion known as Sikhism. 
That is a religion that has been founded by a man named Guru Nanak. He tried to make a synthesis between Islam and Hinduism. I've got two minutes left to cover the rest of the world's major religions. <laughs> So Guru Nanak tried to make a synthesis between Hinduism and Islam. But of course that synthesis fails for a number of reasons. First, that synthesis was brought about in order to make peace between Hindus and Muslims. In order to have a common religion to which everyone can subscribe. So that instead of having Hindus on one side and, and, and Muslims on the other side and the two clashing with each other, have a common religion that everyone can come to and everyone will be at peace. But that uh, attempt failed because what resulted instead is a third religion and now more clashes. So you have Hindus on one side, Muslims on the other side, and Sikhs at the other tip of the triangle. And now we still have clashes in between. So that attempt has failed. Moreover, it failed on the theor theoretical and ideological level. Uh, because if uh, Hinduism is true, uh, then you should have all of Hinduism. And if uh, Islam is true, you should have all of Islam. You cannot have part and, and part. Now since Hinduism and Islam is so uh, different from each other, they cannot both be true at the same time. So by forming a synthesis, naturally you're mixing one true with another one false. And the result is going to be definitely false. So instead of trying to form a synthesis and ending up with something false, you may as well try to find out out of Hinduism and Islam which exactly is the truth and embrace only that. Now I don't have time to go into all of the rest of the religions in detail, but if we come a little bit west from the Indian subcontinent, we come into the Middle East region, where we have in Palestine the religions of Judaism and Christianity emerging. Judaism and Christianity had a claim to being the truth because they had the Bible, which was the Word of God, revealed to humankind, or at least parts of it. But over time the Bible itself became corrupt and changed. In fact, the Bible itself admits to having been changed. In the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 8, verse 8, we read, How can you say we are wise and we have the law of the Lord? Whereas in fact the lying pens of the scribes have falsified it. So the Bible itself claims that the Bible has been corrupt by the lying pens of the scribes. Now the same wording is not found in all Bibles. In English translations, sometimes the attempt is made to cover up these very painful words. But uh, some, uh, no matter how you read it, if you read it carefully, you find out that uh, all Bibles are saying the same thing. For example, the King James Version of the Bible says that the pens of the scribes have rendered it vain. Vain. V-A-I-N. And you know what that means? It means worthless. So if the result is that the Bible itself tells us that the Bible is worthless, then we have reason to search elsewhere. And the last final place that we will look is uh, further into the Middle East, where in Arabia some 1400 years ago, there emerged a man, a man by the name of Muhammad, after whose name I say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings of God be upon him, who received a revelation from the Almighty God. In my previous talk, I explained in detail why we should believe that this book actually is a revelation that was given to him. If we're looking around among the world's major religions to find out which is the truth that we should embrace, that is the one truth that has been revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a guidance for all human kind for all time. A guidance to which every people of every religious persuasion, from every geographical background, from every time and place, uh, should come to. And uh, to which uh, everyone should submit uh, and be in a good relationship with the God and Creator of all humankind. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I've just got two announcements to make. Um, as you can see, this is. Afternoon.